we would not be here without tons of people, including um, our guest speaker, and I would like to just take a moment to thank John Bracken for coming in from DPLA. Over the last two years, I've gotten to know John really well and um, know that his insights and his uh, um, values and his belief in what we do is infinite and I think is going to be enormously helpful for us as MDL uh, matures and moves into um, f the future. Some of you may know that um, I am retiring uh, on July 8th, 11 working days from now. I don't have the hours. <laughs> Ask me about noon and I'll have the hours. Uh, I'm very excited about that. But because this is the last time I'm speaking in front of a group, I'm going to take um, the retiree's prerogative and actually talk more personally than I normally do when I'm up in front of a conference event like this. Because I have something I want to say before I ride off into the sunset. My great niece is a sixth generation Minnesotaner. My mother was born in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. My father was born in Duluth, Minnesota. And I have a dozen relatives buried in the ground in the Fort Snelling Cemetery. My roots in this state are deep and proud. I have lived in eight states and two countries. And I came back to Minnesota. And having been born here and been raised in the values and the, the, ethic, the ethos of kindness and support for each other, and having lived, like I said, pretty much around the world, I can tell you there is something extraordinary happening in this state that I think most people in Minnesota don't truly appreciate. This state is extraordinary. The love that the people who walk this ground have towards this land is deeper than in almost any, deeper than in any place that I have traveled or visited. There is something about this space, this time, this place that brings people together, that brings out often the very best of us. And we are all here, most of it, many of us, I suspect, are here partially because they received legacy funding. Think about that for just a second. During the Great Recession, the people in Minnesota voted to tax themselves to provide arts, to protect the environment, to um, capture the culture, and to keep and treasure our history. Think about that word legacy. We are all of us living in the legacy that we have inherited from our ancestors. And I'm going to add those of you who came from other places to Minnesota because there's something about this state that when you move here, you honestly get captured by it and become a third generation Minnesota after after 10 years, as we just grant that to you automatically. But every one of us in this room recognize the contributions and the legacy of those that came before us. And we spend our labor, our sweat, our blood, our heart's passion to capture and make that information available, the culture and the history we recognize the value of today and we are working to capture what is happening in our communities and, rem and remembering because we also value the legacy for our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. What I would ask of you as you go through the rest of today is to think about that word legacy. We are all part of the Minnesota legacy and those of you in this room are actively working to capture and preserve that legacy for the future. 
And I don't think we take enough pride in what we do because what we do is genuinely extraordinary. It is an honor to be able to work with all of you and to work collaboratively with so many organizations. And I hope as you go through the rest of this day that you can take with you the power of this place, of Minnesota, and the power of the work we do to preserve it for the future. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Valerie. Uh, how am I supposed to follow that? Um, I, I won't, what, what I hope and presume will be a long, there'll be other opportunities this afternoon for folks to comment about Valley. I'll, I, I uh, don't want to start off my talk by tearing up, so I will briefly say Valerie's been a great asset and ally for all of us across the country, not just DPLA, but what you, and been a representative and a voice, just like you just heard, for the strength and power of the work you all do here in this state. Um, and July 8th is not a date any of us look forward to. So I'll, just without uh, further ado, I'll just thank you, Valerie, for everything you've brought to this work and everything you've done for DPLA. Um, and for setting up the bar so high, because now how do I top that profound start? I almost want to just engage with, with uh, legacy and, and Minnesota history, which I won't do. So I will build off of, of something Valerie led with. Oh, I don't, I forgot I have a microphone. I can wander around. Um, and I also will start off by building off of some of my predecessors and some of the shoulders I'm standing in. Even at a five-year-old, six-year-old organization like DPLA, we have predecessors and we have founders, founding fathers and founding mothers. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, first, I also want to give a special thank you to Molly, who invited me and made all this happen and, and brought us to this beautiful space and feeding us. So thank you, Molly, for, for everything you do, not just here, but also Molly's been, as some of you may know, Molly's been also really active in, in DPLA and, and, and leading up um, a lot of our conversations in, in the working groups. So um, I am going to do, let's see if it works. I'm gonna focus on three things. I'm gonna talk a little bit, as I suggested, about DPLA's past and what brought us here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're working, working on today, particularly as we uh, are finalizing our plans and maybe like some of you, we're in the midst of budgeting for fiscal 2020, which kicks off in a couple of weeks. Um, and then I'll take advantage of the timing where we are and share with you some thoughts about our future. Um, partly, I'm going to cheat a little bit and allude to some uh, things that we're hoping to announce in the coming weeks that we're really excited about, which I can't quite fully announce yet, but I can maybe be suggestive about them. Um, and second, I actually, uh, we had a, a lovely dinner last night, and, and Molly and Jolie and John, who was there, and, um, and Gretchen and, and Valerie, planted some seeds in my head about where we are in this historical moment. We, we were, so I'll, I'll, when we talk about the future, I might get a little bit more abstract than, than DPLA. And actually, I'm gonna get my clock out as well. Um, so let me flash back to uh, our founding. So 2010, um, a bunch of people got in a room uh, in, um, at the Radcliffe Institute in Harvard, about 40 of us. Uh, when I say us, I mean it in the royal we. I, uh, I was working at a foundation at the time, and I said no to the invitation to go to this meeting, which, I, which probably wasn't the smartest move for my career path, because it would have been great to have been in that meeting. Um, and, and the conclusion that came out of that conversation was that we were living in a unique historical moment for our institutions and that we as a society at a national level weren't doing enough to capture both the possibility inherent in digital technology and particularly um, the internet for spreading information and for unleashing creativity 
And second, that there was so much energy and possibility popping up across the country, yet there wasn't a national effort to really try to coalesce and move that work forward to ensure that the, all of the knowledge and creativity that we're creating has a digital home. Um, and for everyone, for everyone in this country. And so that was the thrust of that conversation. It was funders, it was some technologists, it was folks from places like Smithsonian and National Archives. And this is the mission that resulted of that, that we launched in, in 2011, to ensure that, that we empower people to learn, grow, and contribute to a better functioning society through shared culture, history, and knowledge. So that's, that's our starting point. That's, you know, that's where we're, that's the baseline that we're working through. Um, and then, so I'm gonna flash forward a little bit. So five years ago, almost to the day, my friend and predecessor, Dan Cohn, spoke here. Valerie already gave me a little bit of the sense of the room, but how many people were in the room five years ago uh, for Dan's talk? All right, so, um, um, this will be new, so I guess I could have just copied Dan's talk and most of you would have been perfectly fine. That would have been a lot easier. Um, but for those of you in, who were here, I am gonna to try to build off, first of all, I think uh, I will stand on Dan's shoulders. Dan, uh, in his remarks, which I watched yesterday, uh, uh, emphasized what Valerie just did, that how important and vital this state and all of you and the institutions you represent have been to this larger project across the country. And I would say even more, the degree to which you all are an inspiration because of the unique approach, structures, investments, values you place on history and, and preserving and sharing culture. Um, I mean, it's, you know, I won't, I, I won't, I can't say it better than Valerie did, so I, so I won't. Um, but what I wanted to do is talk through really um, five things that, that we've achieved since Dan was here five years ago. Five, of the things, five things that we've really built out over the five years. And then I'll, t tell, then I'll share a little bit about where we're hoping to take that. So the first thing is, you know, flash, flash forwarding from the, that meeting in Radcliffe that I mentioned, um, there were no place-based institutions in that meeting of 40 people, right? And I think often those of us who have our noses to the ground don't appreciate what a signal achievement we've made by building out uh, the platform and the network that we have built out that I'll talk through a little bit. So first we now have a, a landing page, dp.la. I think when Dan spoke five years ago, he said, Soon we'll be in the millions in terms of items. Um, soon uh, we will top 50 million items. We, we, we kind of are beginning the calendar when, we're, when that's gonna happen. Um, and, and I can say a little bit more when I get deeper into the presentation about how this works. But none of those 34,442,000 um, items are DPLA items, right? We are but a platform a vessel for the work and collections and curation done by our partners across the US. Um, we're in, those partners come from 41 states um, and represent over 4,000 institutions across the US today. Um, it's something we're really, this, I, I mean, I think this is our signal achievement and as I talk through what our goals are for the future, um, coloring in some of those states that that don't have uh, DPLA, DPLA representations as part of that part of that conversations. Um, I was hoping, so these are some of the new states and new what we call hubs, which is what our state entities are, that have come on board in the last 12 months. Um, I think Connecticut was the most recent one, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, and, and here are some of the new ones that are in the pipeline I was hoping to be able to announce that Vermont was live today. Uh, that'll probably happy w happen within the next week that, that Ver Vermont will be live. Um, so again, over 34 million items that have been uploaded and shared for, for anyone to access. Um, and 
um, over three million of those items come with rights statements. So in other words, are clearly demarcated uh, with permissions for how they can be used. And that's been a project that Molly's been a key actor in, I mean, the, and MDL's been a key actor in. Um, and again, when we get to the what's next, I'll talk a little bit more about where that work's going. This is a, just to give you a visualization of what that growth actually looks like. I'll, I'll point out that we actually, it, we, um, we haven't carried it over into 2019, because if we did, it would be a little bit more of a hockey stick. And I was trying to figure out where I could make a hockey reference in the Minnesota presentation, and there it is. Um, you thought it was gonna be the Wayne Gretzky quote about skate where the puck is going, but it uh, wouldn't be that. Um, and so our current year, we're, we're doing 60% growth in terms of, in terms of uh, collections. Um, we've set up an, we've, had, we've been running an API for, for several years. We didn't start really kind of counting or collecting data around its use until about a year ago. And this is how we've noticed about over a million hits for that. So that's the, that's the infrastructure. That's the baseline of what allows, the, what, what we bring to the table. Um, I think once we had that set up, we really, and again, this is something, I'm gonna sound like a broken record here, but this is something where you all through MDL have been core partners. Um, we, we set about to develop a, an infrastructure so that it wasn't a staff of dp.la domain email people sitting in a room making decisions and setting priorities. That we knew that to succeed, we needed to be engaged and rooted in the work happening in community across the US. And in order, um, and in order to be impactful and to tell our stories and to, to do the work, we had to, we had to build out those structures. So um, that's been a core, since Dan was here, stood on this stage, this metaphorical stage five years ago, that's been a big area of work for us. And again, a lot of you have been in the room for that. Um, so in the last year, we've, established and then activated uh, a council of our members from across the US. Um, one of the nice things I'll say is that over the last year, it, but when I say activate, I mean no longer do DPLA staff set the agenda and call the meeting and run the meeting, but now our members run the meeting and, and uh, uh, in April we had a, a day-long members meeting that DPLA staff didn't run, right? The network ran it, which was great, because that's exactly where we've been trying to get ourselves. Um, we have a, a smaller, and this is, um, Valerie's been serving on this, thank, thank you Valerie for that, uh, an advisory council that, the, that we as DPLA staff meet with monthly, um, that I should say has become incredibly valuable to us over the last year and less. Um, um, and, and again, I guess part of what you're hearing from me hopefully is some excitement that we've activated these structures that we knew that were important, that existed on paper, that we began to build, but in the last year, we've really seen, especially speaking for DPLA staff, we've seen significant value from the conversations and input we've been getting from these, these structures, and I feel like we've just scratched the surface. Um, a component of that work, as I alluded to, uh, with reference to Molly has been the establishment of working groups. Um, and again, the establishment and maintenance and um, prioritization of these working groups is increasingly not something that the DPLA staff control, but something that we help build out in response to conversations, desires, um, um, concerns, and excitements that, that we hear in our, hear in our network. Um, and I guess the third a component related to this is member services. So as we've built out a member program, a paid member program over the last couple of years, it's enabled us to stand up services specifically for, for our members. And I'll talk, touch on a couple of those uh, right now. Um, but maybe first I'll highlight you know, one of the values that they've, that, that, that having a membership program, they, they've brought three things to us as an organization. One is it's been a source of revenue as we've tried to become a, 
a, a multi uh, reliant, a, a, you know, the proverbial three legged stool, right? Ensuring that we're not just surviving on one type of income. And so, thank you for that. That, that the work, the income we have from that is an incredible part of our work and enables us to do do the work. Um, second, it does create an active pipeline and engagement in conversations that impacts our work. And third, and this is one that that I think we don't talk about very much enough, which is that the act of being able to point to the constituency and the buy-in that our constituency has helps us in conversations with other people with whom we want to partner, chief among them funders. It's in, in the, the grants that I am not able to announce yet, uh, being able to point to a membership program, an active membership program, has been invaluable in the conversations we've been having with others about, about philanthropic investment. So three, whoops, three, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, three services just to touch on briefly. So one would be DPLA local, one is data ingestion, and a third is, the, is an analytics dashboard. Uh, and for those of you taking notes, I'm happy to share these slides and or greater details on any of them as, as helpful. Um, so DPLA, DPLA Local was a result, again, out of conversations that we had through these structures that I mentioned, through the, the network and advisory council, and from creating opportunities where we are in dialogue um, with, with our partners. And what we heard was a desire for, from some of our partners to be able to stand up their own instances, right? So their own landing pages of statewide material. So this, our, our pilot program was with Wisconsin, Recollection Wisconsin, um, and so we stood that up a couple of months ago, and more recently, um, the Digital Library of Tennessee. Um, we've stood that up as a, as a, a local instance. Um, these are our first two iterations. Um, I could tell you who the other states are in line, but I don't have them in the back of my head, off the top of my head. Um, but this is something that we're excited to, to kind of see how it plays in the field and, and the potential to stand up other similar instances across the country. Data ingestion is um, something that we've been working to make more efficient, make more impactful, and make it easier uh, for us and for you. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what's in the pipeline going forward, um, but just to talk through the, uh, the, the, so the sort of the core system that we've been deploying and refining over the last it's year and a half, two years, is a product called Ingestion 3. Um, and when I poked my team and said, okay, tell me, Tell me why ingestion three matters. This is the list that I got, right? So I mean, savings, better functionality. Um, actually, you know, so um, um, one of the things that, that came out of this members meeting I mentioned last month were, were other ideas of ways in which we as a central repository or as a central actor may be able to take on um, more tasks from our partners in a more efficient, centralized way, thinking about ourselves as a network. And I can sit, share a little bit more about that when we get to the next level. And the last product that we've been working on over the last year is something called the, an analytics dashboard that we've provided to our members and really trying to help um, provide greater information in, in, in metrics, in views, in user locations, um, and, and things of that sort. Metadata completely this. Um, and this is a terrible slide for you to be able to see, but if those of you who have accessed the dashboard know that it, this is it's a spreadsheet, actually I can probably read it out better from here, but of, of, of the different data available, available to people through the, through the analytics dashboard. Fourth area that we've been focused on fleshing out and engaging with is taking advantage of the fact that I get to go to meetings like this and have dinners like the one I had last night and then I get to go on a plane, and then I get to go to Sacramento and have a similar set of conversations, and how do we take advantage of our unique and, and incredibly fortunate center, ability to be at the center of so many conversations, 
and, and collect the learnings that we're seeing, both within the field, but also on the edges of the field as the world is changing and, and developing. And how do we share those out better? So again, how do we both focus on practical, everyday information and make your work easier and more impactful in your communities and help you tell your stories better? And how do we help ensure that we really are being a pipeline and a resource to understand, prepare for, be excited about and worried about when appropriate the impact of digital on our lives, on our work, on our society. So we do that through a couple of ways. We've been doing that through a couple of ways. One is through DPLA Fest, which is our biannual gathering. How many of you were at DPLA Fest in Chicago last month? A couple of you, great. Um, I recognized most of you from it. Um, um, so, so that's one. Um, we've been doing it through uh, webinars and a newsletter. Um, and trying to do, make those regular parts of our work. So if you're not signed up for our newsletter, we are gearing up to release our June newsletter shortly. Um, so please go to uh, dp.la and sign up for the newsletter or uh, email me at bracken at dp.la and I'll make sure you, if you can't find it, I'll make sure you get to it. Um, so there's a couple shots from uh, DPLA Fest and I guess, you know, you might recognize one of those characters, at least. Um, but, and I didn't just put it in there to play to the home crowd, Valerie. I mean, I guess I, I, I wanted to, each of these is sort of emblematic of one element of the value that at least I heard coming out of DPLA Fest and that we're thinking about how we accelerate and expand upon going forward. So our kickoff plenary conversation was a conversation between Elaine Westbrooks, the librarian at the University of North Carolina, and Dana Boyd, who is a researcher at the Data and Society Institute. Um, and um, it was about kind of, I guess, without, uh, you, you should go watch the YouTube presentation if you haven't seen it. It was facilitated by Joyce Hall, Joyce, um, Joyce Foundation, Tracy Hall from the Joyce Foundation. Um, and it was a conversation about memory, about history, and about the role of technology in impacting community and power. And I guess that's incredibly broad, but it was an incredibly rich conversation to kick us off as emblematic of some of the types of conversations that we helped, we hope to help bring to the table. Um, Valerie's presentation is emblematic of the, the breakout sessions that we had that were completely community curated. DPLA staff maybe curated a couple, but the, the breakout sessions we had were, were submitted and curated and were really focused on um, on the work being done by our partners and opportunities and problem sets that people saw in front of them, practical engagements. And uh, we also, uh, the, that, la that picture on the bottom is representative of the network council meeting that we had. Those are three of our representatives on the, on the advisory council, including Greg Cram, who also stood on this stage metaphorically a couple of years ago before me, who's been a, who chairs our advisory council. So it's a time for us to come together, compare notes on the work we've been doing, and also to introduce some ideas that we might not have been thinking about otherwise. Um, our webinars are things that we're trying to do quarterly, if not maybe a little bit more often going into the next year. Um, increasingly, we want ourselves not to be the ones holding the microphone again, but we want more and more of our partners to be the ones being able to share their work out with, with one another and with our other partners. Um, so the fifth and final kind of five-year engagement I wanted to talk about is about e-books, about e-content. Um, again, it's an area, again, I'll go back to my broken record. It's an area where Minnesota has been a core partner and um, hopefully it'll be even more so going forward with us. Um, um, I think our motivation, our thought process is as knowledge is increasingly transmitted, shared, consumed in digital platforms, we, as a field, need to be at the table and active at, um, in, in that creation and in that participation. Um, and, and what we have built out with a set of partners and what we're seeking to build out more broadly nationally is a platform that can be curated by and for libraries and librarians. 
um, where our, our, one of our principal partners is New York Public Library, which has built and maintained a product called Simply E, a mobile reading app, uh, built off of open source code. And what we announced at um, DPLA Fest in April uh, with the participation of MDL as a, as a key part of our founding um, advisory council um, is a national effort to build out a digital platform, first for eBooks, increasingly for other types of products. Um, it's something we're incredibly excited about. Um, it fits in those categories of things, of uh, announcements I have in my back, back pocket that aren't quite fully baked yet, but so stay tuned. There's more that we're gonna be sharing and I'm happy to share more um, in the conversation zone. I will point to something that we unrolled a week or two ago, uh, which is an ebook, an open ebook version of the Mueller report. I should say this was before Mr. Mueller uh, urged us all to read the, read the report, but here it is. Uh, if, you, if, you ha if you haven't read the report and you want an ebook version of it, a very nice, clean ebook version of it, go to your Simply E app and, and download it. Um, I will say we are working with some partners, including the Internet Archive, to embed, to make this more multimedia and embed some uh, hyperlinks and, and sort of give it, give it even more life. But this has been something that we were excited to unveil uh, two weeks ago. Oh, there it is. See, I told you it was clean and pretty. So, so that's the last five years. That's everything, you, it's, that's everything we've done since Dan Cohen sat here five years ago. Um, and I wanna talk about where we are, and again, where we are for me right now is thinking about 2020, so immediate things that we're thinking through. Um, so I'm gonna talk about three things. These three things are um, the result of a strategic planning process that we're, we're wrapping up now um, and, and, and about to announce a finalization of. But these are three sort of insights of ways in which we do our work that we think are really important and, and are important to emphasize. One is, as I hope is clear from what you're hearing me say, is about that we only succeed when our partners do. That None of those 34 million items are ours. Um, none of those eBooks downloads come from patrons or cardholders of DPLA. Um, we exist as a platform to help benefit our partner institutions across the US. Second is, and sometimes this is hard in this world, we're optimistic. We are fundamentally optimistic about the United States about the role of um, citizens, active, informed, engaged citizens in a democracy, about the importance and centrality of our institutions as we try to figure out what democracy is and how it exists in a digital context. And we're fundamentally optimistic about the role of technology and being an asset in that. And often those are, you know, sometimes in some contexts, um, those can be hard, Conver those it can be hard to find that optimism. Um, we're certainly, I would say, it's harder to be optimistic in some of those contexts for a lot of us today than it was five years ago. Um, but it's something that we fundamentally believe. We grow out of a tradition that is excited about the possibility of the web for unleashing knowledge for everyone and encouraging creativity among everyone. And, and that's our, that's one of our guiding principles. Third is we want to ensure that we are serving and empowering communities and individuals, especially those who have been traditionally um, not at the table, not at tables like the ones that we come from, that we convene, or that traditionally have been uh, barred from some of those conversations and projects. And so specifically that, what that means is we want to do a better and more focused job of ensuring that every institution in the US has a pipeline into DPLA, particularly those, in, those that institutions that are, or projects that come from, speak fr about, or tell stories from communities that have traditionally been marginalized and, um, 
and under attack. So what does that mean? So that's our high level, those are three notes on how we want to approach our work. Um, now I want to give you a couple of our goals for the, for, that we're setting out as we look for, for 2020. And again, in my brain, 2020 is starting in, in about three weeks. Uh, one, we really want to nurture the network. We want that, that signal achievement that I mentioned over the first five years, we want to continue double down on that. That's our core work. That's what we're known for, and that's what we want to stretch and grow and expand. Um, and that's through a couple of different um, specific projects that are on our drawing table. And again, these are specific projects that come from conversations with our partners. Um, one is working with IIIF and other partners to improve the availability and accessibility around images. Second, increasingly, increasing the ability to curate uh, materials so that, again, in enabling you or now our other partner institutions to curate collections as they see fit. And third, enabling custom DPLA stand-ups, which I can, I'll touch on in a second. Um, actually, I guess I won't touch on, so I'll touch on it here. Um, I don't have another slide about it. Um, so that base, so one of the ways we're thinking about that, so we, we're in a project right now with Clear and, um, uh, and some other partners where we're focusing on an archive based around Pan Am Airlines. And so one of the things we're exploring is are there other opportunities in, a, in, in addition to or beyond geographically based collaborations and collections, are there other types of community based or interest based um, projects and customizations that we should be exploring? Um, second, we're looking to expand the e-content work that I mentioned. Um, and that takes a couple of different forms. One, we'll, we're looking to develop audiobook and audiobook solutions. Second, we want to grow the list of titles we have. Right now we're, we're somewhere south of half a million titles right now. We want to grow and expand that. And second, similar to what I mentioned in terms of the power of this national community we've built out, we want to make sure that the ebooks work borrows from that approach and maybe even accelerates it. We don't want to wait five years to stand this up. Um, and, and again, this is an area where, 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 I don't know if Paul's here, but Paul Swanson has been a key actor and partner and will be even more so a key actor and partner in the months to years to come. But ensuring that this is not uh, you know, a case where DPLA and, and or New York Public Library or Lyricist, who's another partner of ours in this work, is off in a room somewhere um, doing work, but that we're really informed by, engaged with, and led as part of a larger, a larger community effort. The third part is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we want to double down on our ability to bring people together to share knowledge and convene conversations. Um, we're still figuring out what that means, um, and we're in conversations actually with a couple of partners sort of that we've not partnered with in the past that are, again, slightly adjacent to our world of cultural heritage and libraries, where we think we could put together some interesting conversations and dialogues uh, in between or maybe even alongside of some of our more core, core meeting work. And I, I can talk through that a little bit if you like. Um, so lastly, I want to fa fa flash forward again, building off the conversation that happened at dinner last night, think a little bit about the future and, and imagine a little bit about what the context might be five years from now. Again, I hope it's not five years, it's another five years until a DPLA executive director is addressing this group. But flash, if, as I've thought about where we came from over the last five years, I wanted to think a little bit about what our world might look like in 2024 um, and how DPLA needs to prepare and add value to such a context. Um, one is, I hope we've worked through a lot of the angst that we're feeling right now, right? I mean, five years ago, um, we weren't talking about democracy ending. I mean, actually, some of us were, but not, not every day in the front page of the newspaper. Um, we weren't talking about is the, you know, what's the future of humanity? Is humanity gonna be uh, overtaken by, 
by software and by artificial intelligence. Um, these conversations, I think, are real. I don't mean to imply that they're hype, um, but I think they're so important for us knowing, as, as part of the larger conversations happening about um, what does it mean to have a democratic society in a digital 21st context, um, I think the work that we're doing needs to be central and, and part of those conversations and take those debates on heads on. Um, you know, the, the conversations we're having, again, almost daily about even the threat to the planet are much more pronounced existential conversations right, right now about what is the future of, uh, are we gonna be able to live on this planet a uh, hundred years from now? Um, these conversations, again, were happening five years ago, but I feel like they're much more pronounced, much more direct, right? The, the protests happening in Europe right now around the Extinction Rebellion. For those of us with kids, this, this is a much more pronounced sort of uh, moment, I think, than we've had before. And I think it's sobering for all of us as we try to imagine where our projects fit in as we go forward. So specifically, so that, that's, that's sort of the depressing note of how we ended dinner last night. So I wanted to build off of that a little bit about where we, where we sit. And I'll try, to, I'll try to land it in a slightly, slightly optimistic note, first by talking about what role I think DPLA can play in the next five years in taking on some of those debates. One, ensuring that every American institution that wants one has a pipeline in, into DPLA. Um, our chief mode of doing that is through state-based hubs, and I think that's gonna continue to be our primary mode. Um, and I wanna make sure that it, we have a hub for every state, but I also think that there are opportunities for other ways for us to ensure that every institution in the US that wants to be part of DP.LA has one. Second, as these new technologies and machine learning and artificial intelligence increasingly come online, we want to be a, an explorer, and again, from our optimistic but not Pollyannish standing, we want to help the field understand and explore those topics and what they mean for our work, what they mean for our workers, um, and what they mean for the people who use and consume our materials, and what it means for where we sit as institutions in, in society. And I think that's, um, the, I, I, I feel practically taking on the issues is one way, for me at least, to feel less pessimistic about the doom and gloom headlines I just showed you. Third, we want to be a partner to ensure that knowledge continues to be more widely available and shared in a digital context and not less so in a it, than in, in an analog world. Um, I think there's a lot for us to do there. I think, you know, our initial conversations, we, in that, in that room in the Radcliffe Institute that I showed you, we talked a lot about what a role for a national digital library should be in terms of questions of the public domain and fair use. Um, and I think we could have a role to play in exploring some of those issues. And again, ensuring that our future, in our future, knowledge is more available and more accessible to everyone and not less so, which I think is the, the nightmare scenario. Um, and lastly, and this is a selfish, a selfish one, I think, and a selfish task for us, is to ensure that we at DPLA is still in the ball game and still relevant, and to do so, we need to ensure that we are, have multiple funding streams. And that's kind of technocratic and that's maybe nonprofit CEO leader speak. But from our launch, we were so lucky to have active engagement from a set of philanthropic leaders. And that's enabled us, along with the buy-in from communities across the US, to really stand up and exist. But from our outset, and even more so today, we know that we can't have a one-legged stool. Um, it's part of the reason why we're excited about our eBooks partnership and collaboration, because we are, we're engaging that in that with an eye towards earning revenue to spin back into the larger work of the organization. It's part of the reason why things like membership and these events that I mentioned, which have become sponsorship, which have become opportunities for us to begin to earn revenue through things like sponsorship, are really exciting for us. So, you know, again, that's 
not as existential in the big question tied to the future of humanity and the coming of the robots, but as an institution, as a, as a six-year-old nonprofit, that last point is core to where we're going to be um, four years ago. So, you know, I, I, I played around with different sort of, you know, uh, Minnesota-related hooks, and instead I had to land on a, another Scandinavian. Um, um, this, of course, and now I'm blanking on her name, and I won't be able to pronounce her last name anyway, but this is the... The, the Swedish teenager who's become the key voice, a key voice, a Nobel Prize, Peace Prize nominee, sp speaking out very forcefully and strongly uh, for the new generation and the potential and the need for us to wrestle with those larger existential questions about what, where, what are we doing with our planet. And, and I guess I put her here because it makes me feel optimistic when I look at the next generation as we're passing the torch to the, in leadership of, in the explorations of what knowledge and creativity look like in a, and democracy look like in a digital context. Um, it makes me feel more empowered that we are one link in that chain, that we're, that we're not the last ones. If anything, we're the, the generations coming behind us are even better equipped to take on some of these issues. Um, so I don't know who's gonna be here in five years to speak to you, hopefully I'll be here. But hopefully we'll have taken on some of those challenges I mentioned and made real progress. And I know for a fact that it, to the degree that we're able to make progress over the next five years, um, you all in this room, your institutions, and Minnesota generally are going to be core and central to that work, just as you have been to the last five years. So thank you very much. I'll stop there. The question was, uh, the, there was a slide that said we want to work more with communities directly, and how would we go about, how, do, how are we thinking about operationalizing that? Is that, um, there's been, I think part of the exciting moment is a lot of our partners, including uh, institutions that maybe have not been part of our conversations over the last few years, have taken that issue on and have begun to build roadmaps. Map um, and we've have, we have one project that's on our sketch, our drawing board that's enabled us to begin to do this. Um, um, and actually Mellon Foundation has supported some work through, uh, led by Burgess Jules, who's now at, at History Pen, thinking through how institutions, and especially higher ed institutions, can and should do a better job engaging with community-based projects um, and, and specifically community, non-institutional based projects, community-based archives sitting outside of the academy and especially coming from communities of color. Um, and among the, the, the learnings or insights that I've picked up from some of those conversations, and there's a great paper that they issued that I'm, I'm blanking on the title of, um, are maybe not surprisingly, one, things like uh, don't, is avoid colonization. Like let's let's be post-colonial. Let's not uh, ask communities for their stuff for free. If we're going to ask, to, if we're going to seek to partner with community-based organizations, let's make sure they have a seat at the table in how the project is designed, in how we're thinking about use, and how we're imagining the stories that might come out of it, and how we're connect collecting data and sharing out the data, and how revenue and or whether it's grant money or other things are being shared. I as part of the development of that project that I mentioned that we're sketching through, I talked to some community-based archive leaders and they told, I heard several stories of being asked to engage in a project and then in giving up collections or giving up time and then at the end of it, getting a CD or a jump drive that they didn't have a clear way to use. Um, so I guess that's one element of it, Valerie. And then I guess another is but maybe that's just summed up basically by empathy, right? So it's like being conscious of power and, and our traditions and our histories of race and exploitation and taking those on, putting those on the table and taking them on heads on. And then I think another one for us practically is knowing that we're, we're here, that we're working through our partners on the ground because we're not gonna build all the relationships, right? Often we're sort of a step through relationship. So how do we, how do we enable you to have those conversations? How do we get ourselves out of the, out of the middle? 
Is that helpful? Yeah, no, Europeana is a great partner. You know, we engage with them fairly regularly, in particular around the right statements work. I think it's maybe the most practical area where we've got direct engagements right now. Um, um, and in a series of conversations that have, you know, kind of ebb and flow, frankly, uh, around ways in which uh, digital libraries and projects like ours across the world can collaborate and better work together. Um, I will say one of the ways, at least for me, at my, uh, in the conversations I've had, that I've benefited from those conversations is realizing, for better or worse, what an odd duck we are here in the United States, right? I forget what the staffing and fiscal investment in Europeana or similar projects in Australia, New Zealand, and India are, but we're, you know, we're not a state-supported ent enterprise, um, and I think that's got pluses and minuses. Uh, it requires us to be a little bit more entrepreneurial and, and scrappy than, than uh, we might be if we were a government-supported project. But certainly, you know, as we look at corollaries and, and partners, kind of look at the work they're doing, and a lot of the things that we're talking about, the kind of practical things, like things like IIIF implementations, are things that we talk with them about as well.